So, Katie, what have you got to show me today? Well, Ryan, last time we talked, you said you would like to see some conservation alternatives planned on your farm. And I wanted to stop in and show you what I have worked up for you. Okay, let's see what you have. Well, look at, look at this. Here's your 320-acre farm on Section 27. You can orient yourself from this perspective, as if you were standing on the south side of your farm and looking north. You can see Walnut River in the lower left-hand corner and then see the small tributary Oak Creek that runs north through your field. Okay, I get that. So last time we talked, you said that you were using a full-width tillage system on both your corn and your soybean residue. Yeah, that's right. I fall till everything, uh, both my corn and soybean residue. You're probably going to tell me to consider something else? <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. I'm only going to show you alternatives. From there, it's your decision to decide what is best for you. I'm going to toggle through the three alternatives so you can see the description of each one. Just to review, alternative one is your baseline or what you're doing today. When we last talked, you said you wanted to stay in a corn soybean rotation, but you might want to consider no-tilling your corn into your soybean residue. We call that alternative number two. Then I also threw in a corn soybean rotation with a complete no-till system where you are no-tilling both your corn and your soybeans. That I called alternative three. Wait a minute, I don't know about that. I know, it's a pretty drastic change, but remember, it's only for your own information. Are you able to show me any structural practices like terraces or even grass waterways? Absolutely, we'll get to that. But first, let's start with the soil erosion on your farm. This is the water erosion risk layer. It identifies areas of the field that are naturally at risk for soil erosion, regardless of the current management. So you mean if all management is held equal, I can see the most erosive areas? That's right. It allows you to easily compare one area in a field with another area, or one field with another field. You can see in this layer that you have quite a bit of highly erodible land. The only areas in this field that are not at risk for soil erosion is the flat bottom along your stream. Since this layer is independent of management, it shouldn't change when you toggle through alternatives 1, 2, and 3? That's right, Ryan. This water erosion risk layer is based on the slope and soil erosivity. It does not change regardless of what you are doing for management. Now let's look at soil erosion. The soil erosion layer will change when your management changes. First, let's look at what you're doing now, alternative one. Let's say that is your baseline. When you see green in this layer, it is good. In this layer, red is bad and indicates more soil erosion. How bad? Ryan, red is pretty bad. Anything that is green means you are below the NRCS tolerable soil loss level, or what they refer to as T. For this field, the tolerable soil loss level is five tons per acre per year. In the areas that are yellow, you are typically, typically be between T and 2T, or 5 and 10 tons per acre per year. Those areas that are in red are typically above 10 tons per acre per year. Wow, do you really think that can be right? Yeah, Ryan, I do. Look at this dime. Think of 5 tons per acre as being the thickness of this dime. If you lose 5 to 10 tons per acre per year of soil, you lose the depth of a dime or two dimes every year. You probably would never notice that, would you? I guess not. You have a lot of yellow and red in your current system, which is alternative one. Let's take a look at the system you're thinking about, where you are still doing full width tillage on your corn stalks, but you are no-tilling your corn into your soybean residue. You can see we lose a lot of the red, or the areas with high erosion, and more of the yellow areas go to green. This is very typical of what I would expect for soil reduction with one year of no-till. Wow, that makes quite a bit of difference, doesn't it? It sure does. Now let's take a look at continuous no-till. you got to be kidding me. Continuous no-till gets me below 5 tons per acre per year on all my cropland? Yes, it does. Continuous no-till is very effective at reducing soil erosion. Maybe, but I think that is more than I want to do. I'm not that big of a fan of no-till. I totally understand, but it's always good to know your options. 
Also, Ryan, if you want more detailed information on soil erosion, you can always click on, here on Report and get access to the full soil calculator report. That's good to know. I'll look at that in depth later. But while I have you here, what else do you have to show me? Are you interested in soil health? I don't know. I hear a lot about it, but I'm not really sold on its benefits yet. I understand, Ryan, but I'd like to, like to show you anyway. Let's start with the soil health layer. This layer is produced by the Soil Conditioning Index, or what you might re hear referred to as SCI. The Soil Conditioning Index was developed by the Natural Resources Conservation Service to help farmers understand how their rotations and tillage systems impact their soil health. In this layer, the dark blue is bad and the light blue is good. The areas of dark blue show where your soil health is getting worse. The medium blue is where your soil health is staying pretty steady and the light blue is where your soil health is improving. So the only areas where my soil health is improving is in the bottoms where I have no erosion? That's right. What goes into the soil conditioning index anyway? Well, the soil conditioning index takes into account three things. First, the level of organic matter. Second, your field operations. And third, your erosion levels. It's not perfect, but the SCI has proven to be pretty accurate. As we move to areas with less tillage, you can see how the soil health changes. As you reduce tillage, you not only reduce soil erosion, but you also improve soil health. And with complete no-till, soil health really improves. Yeah, I can see that. Okay, what else? You know, Ryan, you're in the Walnut Creek watershed. There's a lot of sediment in this river. Yeah, the water clarity isn't what it used to be. I won't even let my kids play in it anymore. Most of the water quality problem is caused from sediment, from erosion. I suppose some of that's my dirt. Well, let's take a look and find out. It's one thing to have soil erosion, but that doesn't always tell the whole story for water quality. For soil erosion to have an impact on water quality, the eroded soil has actually have to get to the stream or river. So just because I have five tons per acre per year of soil loss, it's not all getting to the stream? Yeah, that's right. When someone tells you that you have five tons per acre year of soil erosion, that just means the soil is moving around in your field. The soil could move a thousand feet, or in some cases, it could only move 10 feet. Really? Then how can I know what impact my farm has on water quality? Well, let's take a look at the sediment delivery graph here. You can see the sediment delivery to the stream or field edge in this graph. In your current system, or alternative one, you are having, on average, 1,500 tons of sediment getting into your stream or field edge. Using alternative two, you can reduce that to just over 900 tons. So what you're telling me is that one year no-till is going to cut that sediment delivery about in half? Well, not quite half, but almost. Let's take a look at alternative three, which is continuous no-till. Continuous no-till would cut your sediment delivery down from your current rate of 1,500 tons to less than 150 tons. That is a tenfold reduction, Ryan. Wow, that's hard to believe. I know, it sounds incredible, but that information is based on years of research and field monitoring. Well, I guess that's why every soil conservationist preaches the benefits of no-till. Got that right. So is that it? Well, earlier you asked about structural practices like terraces and basins. Are you still interested in seeing some of the results? Sure, why not? Okay, you may or may not have an interest in a pond. Regardless, I want to show you what a pond could do for you, both in terms of soil erosion and sediment delivery. Let's start by looking at the cropping system you are using today. Notice that when I turn on the pond layer, the soil erosion map doesn't change. Yeah, why is that? That's because a pond wouldn't impact soil erosion in your field. Where you will see the impact of a pond is in your sediment delivery. Look at the top bar chart when I click on and off the pond. Without the pond, the sediment delivery is 1,526 tons. But when we apply the pond, sediment delivery drops to 827 tons. If you took a pond in Alternative 1, you achieve about the same level of sediment delivery as switching to no-till for just one year. 
Actually, the pond with my current system is a little better for water quality. You're right, but your pond will cost a little more than $50,000. $50,000 a chunk of money. Yeah, but it'd be a beautiful pond. It would have a water surface of about 9 acres and a depth of 28 feet. Plenty deep for fishing. But it would take up some cropland, wouldn't it? It would, but that is the trade-off. What would a pond do under Alternatives 2 or 3? Well, in Alternative 2, it reduced the sediment delivery from 9, 919 tons down to 495 tons. In Alternative 3, it would reduce sediment delivery from 144 tons to just 77 tons. So it looks like it would be best to combine the pond with Alternative 1 because it would reduce sediment delivery by about 700 ton. But when we looked at Alternative 3, the pond only reduces the sediment delivery by about 67 tons a year. Yeah, that's because under Alternative 3, there is a little sediment delivery to start with, and the addition of the pond isn't very helpful. But under Alternative 1, won't the pond catch a lot of silt? That is the downside, Ryan. With what you're currently doing, your pond is going to act as kind of a sediment trap. Instead of sediment getting to the stream, it will be trapped into the pond. Well, then it may not be much good for raising fish. If you're interested in a pond for recreation, I suggest you look at Alternative 2 or Alternative 3 to keep the water cleaner. But if you are looking to improve the water quality for the sake of the watershed project, then Alternative 1 with a pond would be really helpful. I get it. What about some smaller basins or what I call doodle dams? Well, some people refer to them as doodle dams, but most commonly are they are called water and sediment control basins. To demonstrate, I designed four water and sediment control basins in your field. There are three upstream from the pond location and one off to the side. First, look at the three water and sediment control basins upstream from the pond. I am going to turn them on, number one, number two, and number three. So how do these basins interact with the pond? Well, let's take a look. If we put in basin number one, we get a 44 ton reduction in sediment delivery. And by putting in basin number two, we get an additional 76 ton reduction. If we put in basin number three, we get another 60 ton reduction. Since each one of them is in a different drainage area, the benefits are cumulative for 180 tons per year total. Okay. Can I see what it would look like with the pond in the three basins? Sure. Let's turn on the pond at the same time we turn on basin number one, two, and three. The sediment reduction number is the same from the pond whether or not you have the three basins. That's right. The pond is doing all the sediment control. Since it is downstream from the basins, it is doing all the work regardless of the basins. So there really is no additive value. That's correct, but the basins are going to be a cheaper alternative and take less land out of production. Plus, they will capture the sediment higher on the landscape. And if I want to use the pond for fishing, they would keep my pond cleaner? Absolutely correct. How much would these basins cost, though? To see the cost of any practice, you can click on the practice layer and get additional information. For instance, basin number one costs about $12,386. And if you want more information on any of these edge of field practices, you can click on the hyperlink design report in this pop-up box. These design reports will give you very detailed information on the size and cost of the practices. You said you designed a fourth basin. Where's that at? Well, basin number four is over here to the side. Since this basin does not drain through the drainage area of the pond, it acts independently of the pond. Unlike basins one, two, and three, you can get additive reductions in sediment delivery from basin number four along with the pond. Okay, I get how the pond and basins reduce sediment delivery, but it doesn't seem they, ha they will have much effect on soil erosion. You are absolutely right. The pond and basins act as sediment traps. They don't reduce soil erosion. Instead, they just trap the soil after it moves. So I'm guessing they don't have much impact on soil health then. Well, let me show you. Look at your current system, Alternative 1. When we apply the ponds or basins, the soil health map doesn't change. 
That is because soil health is based on organic matter, tillage, and soil erosion. The addition of the pond or basins doesn't change any of those. Well, that makes sense. What is with the graphs for cost, though? We are currently building those out. They're not yet completed. What we want to finally get to is where we can help you as a farmer determine the best bang for your buck when you're looking at soil conservation options. We want to help you understand the annual cost of different conservation scenarios on an annual basis and then determine how much it costs to reduce sediment delivery by one ton. Yeah, that would be helpful. I love having some insight to those practices that will significantly improve my water quality while still keeping my cost down, though. Well, Ryan, that's it for now. If you want to see other systems, I certainly can work those up for you. Well, that's better information on soil conservation and water quality than I've ever received before. I like it that it's specific to my farm and gives me enough detail to help me make some decisions. Well, let me know if you'd like me to come back and we can talk about other options. Well, thanks for stopping out today, Katie. Thanks, Ryan. Good to talk to you.